Before we begin, we'd like to give special thanks to all of our sponsors for making this event possible each year. Specifically, thank you to CRL FormFox for being our title sponsor for six consecutive years. And thank you to our platinum sponsors, Psychmedics, Orsure Technologies, Quest Diagnostics, and Veriforce. Hello, and thank you so much for joining us for another session of Day with DISA. Today, we're getting a DOT update focused on oral fluid from Patrice Kelly, Senior Policy Executive Advisor for INDESA, the National Drug and Alcohol Screening Association. And Patrice, I believe you're also uh, still working with the DOT, right? That is correct, Thomas. Thank you. Yes. Awesome. Well, we're excited to have you here today. Before we jump into your presentation, I do want to remind everyone that if you have any questions, use the Q&A button at the bottom right of the player. Any questions we're unable to answer today, we will reach back out to you after Day with DISA. Additionally, we'll make a copy of this presentation available for download on the Materials tab as the session is wrapping up. With that being said, Patrice, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Thomas. It's a pleasure to be with everybody, and thank you to DISA for inviting me to present. So the presentation I'm giving deals with, as Thomas mentioned, the DOT regulated oral fluid testing, the current status, and planning for the future. In short, are you ready for it? In my current role, I am the Senior Policy Executive Advisor to Endesa, the National Drug and Alcohol Screening Association but I am also a U.S. Department of Transportation employee, as Thomas had mentioned. And so here's my mandatory disclaimer. I'm an employee on detail. The views here are expressed in my personal capacity. They have not been subject to review, clearance, or approval by DOT, and they do not necessarily represent the views of the U.S. Department of Transportation. With that said, I also was the primary author on the oral fluid rule and the longest serving director of the Office of Drug and Alcohol Policy and Compliance. So I know an awful lot of you who are watching this today and, um, you know, I have a lot of experience and um, we've had a great working relationship over the years. So I'm here to present more to you. Okay, um, first, the National Drug and Alcohol Screening Association, the organization with which I'm serving, is um, a, an organization that I'm sure many of you know about. Our mission is to advocate for safe and drug-free workplaces and communities, and that is something that is very near and dear to my heart. It, they're the largest trade association, and their members include the whole gamut of individuals from collectors through third-party administrators, medical review officers. Uh, we have collectors for both DOT and non-DOT work and laboratories, alcohol collectors, substance abuse professionals. It's a member-owned and member-driven organization. And the executive director is Joe McGuire. Her email address is presented here. And every Wednesday at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, we have town hall webinar meetings. These, you do not have to be a member of Endesa to join in on town hall. And these are phenomenal sessions where people talk about real questions that they have in real time. And they get advice from other practitioners in the area and then also we discuss it, uh, if there are DOT related questions, I participate in it, et cetera. And it's just a really fun, interesting forum. And as I said, nobody's required to be a member in order to join us for town hall. So for the presentation overview, this is kind of our roadmap of where we're going. We'll talk about the oral fluid approval that has occurred, the timing for implementation. And, you know, is it as reliable as urine testing? We'll talk about that. What do employers need to know for their own programs? Really a key point for everybody who's watching this. We'll do an overview of the entire oral fluid final rule because frankly, it's not just about oral fluid. We made several improvements to the existing DOT regulation part 40 and only some of them pertain to oral fluid, but I'm hopeful that you're going to see an awful lot of good things uh, that suit your business needs too. There are business choices for employers we'll be discussing, the standing orders and employer protocols, and we'll have just a little bit of time for questions and answers. 
So the Department of Health and Human Services, which is the scientific body that Congress has designated for the U.S. Department of Transportation to use, approved oral fluid testing in 2019. The U.S. Department of Transportation initiated a final rule effective June 1st, 2023. So June 1st of this year, the provisions became effective. It allows all DOT agencies, including the United States Coast Guard, to permit testing once labs are approved. That means labs being approved by the Department of Health and Human Services, our scientists. By the way, there's no oral fluid testing for FRA's post-accident testing program. Why is that? Because those tests are not conducted under Part 40 anyway. Those are tests that the Federal Railroad Administration themselves administer. They pay for them. Uh, they are completely outside Part 40 with that. So the HHS certified laboratories are absolutely essential. DOT regulated testing cannot occur without them. HHS has not yet certified any laboratories, but there must be one lab certified for the primary testing. And then one lab must be certified to conduct secondary, that is split testing. So in other words, if somebody tests positive for a drug, there needs to be a split testing lab available to confirm that positive test result. As of this time, no labs have applied for HHS certification, and when they do, it'll take about three to six months from the point an application is received. So DOT must wait for an HHS certified primary and secondary split specimen lab. How are you going to know whether or not this has happened? Well, if you're on the DOT's listserv, and I suggest that you do hop on to the ODAPSI listserv. You'll find out that way. And I'll just drop your little public service announcement as this, www.transportation.gov forward slash ODAPC. That's Oscar Delta Alpha Papa Charlie. www.transportation.gov forward slash ODAPC. When you open up the ODAPC webpage, you're going to see a spot very soon near the top where you can click and join listservs. And it's a great way to just stay current on information pertaining to drug testing, DOT regulated. And if you are not on the listserv, then you can rely on other organizations to provide you with the information. But if you are somebody who is required to be qualified under the DOT regulations, such as a collector, a breath alcohol technician, a medical review officer, or a substance abuse professional. As a matter of federal law, it's required that you be on the listserv. But for everybody else, it's just great information to have and they will not spam you. You're only going to hear when something is actual and necessary. So there's also a web page for HHS certified laboratories. And again, you can get to that through the DOT webpage, HHS, uh, HTTPS slash slash www.transportation.gov forward slash ODAPC forward slash labs. And when you look at the monthly listing of HHS certified labs, HHS has a placeholder, which today says no labs have been approved yet for oral fluid testing, but it does give you the urine labs. And finally, NDESA, the organization I'm serving on this detail with, NDESA will also be in the loop and they will be providing information to their members. So is testing um, going to be as effective for the uh, audiences who are using it? I'm sorry, is oral fluid testing going to be as effective for the audiences who are using it as it is for the audiences who are currently using urine? And the answer is yes. HHS has provided language in their preambles to explain that the scientific basis for the use of oral fluid as an alternative specimen for drug testing has now been broadly established. And the advances in the use of oral fluid in detecting drugs have made it possible for this alternative specimen to be used in federal programs with the same level of confidence that has been applied to the use of urine. That's very important because when you're discussing this with your employees, if your unions ask you questions about it, you can say, yes, it has the same scientific and forensic supportability of drug test results as is seen for urine. DOT similarly 
put out information in our preamble where we talked about how directly observed collections have always been the most effective method for preventing individuals from cheating. So we know that individuals can hide things and then put it into their urine in the enclosed space, in the privacy of the enclosed space they're given for urine testing. But every oral fluid test will be directly observed at every point. So there's no more of an opportunity to hide adulterants and substituting products and actually deploy them during the test. Now everything's done directly in front of the collector. Once those laboratories are approved by HHS, all of the collection process will occur in front of the collector and it will make it more effective and more secure. So while today a directly observed urine collection only occurs, of course, in follow-up, return to duty, um, and other types of testing where there is suspicion that has been introduced to the process, all oral fluid tests will be directly observed. So it replaces those more embarrassing situations that are currently done under urine for the body to bottle observation. And it adds an extra layer of security for all the rest of the collections. So again, oral fluid, all oral fluid collections are directly observed because they're always collected in front of the collector. Okay, so how long are we talking about? There should be another four to six months from now for employers to prepare before the first labs are certified. There's work to be done on the employer side. Policies may need to be updated. Um, for example, the Federal Railroad Administration requires that policies be updated and the Federal Railroad Administration is working on those updated policies right now. But if they're not regulated, by, if you're not regulated by the FRA, you will still want to take a look at your own policies and also your collective bargaining agreements. You may want to bring those up to speed too. Employers are going to need to ensure that their designated employer representative's name and telephone number are correctly listed on the Federal Drug Testing Custody and Control Form starting now. That was effective June 1st. So it is absolutely essential that collectors are able to reach the DER and ask questions when necessary. And employers are going to need to have standing orders in place to direct their collection sites for all tests. In other words, the way I like to phrase it to people is today with urine testing, when you send an employee in, everybody knows what kind of test to administer. It's sort of like you're sending them in and they're going to get a vanilla cone. But after the first oral fluid labs are approved, there's a choice to be made. And that choice is not to be made by the employee. That choice is to be made by the employer. Is it going to be a vanilla cone for this type of test? Is it going to be a chocolate cone, meaning an oral fluid test? Or if it starts as one type, if it starts as a vanilla cone, and then it has to move to a directly observed collection. So the employer is going to want to use a second methodology, oral fluid, because they don't want to go through an oral fluid, a, a directly observed urine collection. Then you may have a swirl encountered. One way or another, this is all up to the employer. And the employer needs to establish a protocol or what we refer to throughout the preamble of part 40 as a standing order to tell your collection sites, hey, this is what I want you to do when my employee comes in for a random test. This is what I want you to do if there's a shy bladder during a urine test. This is what I want you to do if I've got a return to duty test. And I'll show you an example of a standing order which I designed for Endesa and which Joe McGuire, the executive director, put into a fillable PDF format, and we provide available free of charge on the Endesa website. So I'll show that to you in a little bit. So in order to prepare and get more information on all of these topics, you can also consider signing up for one of Endesa's regional trainings. We are, quote, bringing oral fluid training home to you. And this, um, the title was my idea. And what I wanted to do was be able to go around the country and 
train people one-on-one. -on -one. These are not virtual trainings. These are in-person trainings. And right now we have them designed for train the trainer. So in other words, the people who will train the collectors in the long run, we have train the trainer, oral fluid training going around and I'm instructing in that. And then the other one, which I do exclusively is an employer course. What do employers, consortium third-party administrators and others need to know about oral fluid testing. So it's a deep dive into standing orders, into revising policies, into the a deep look at the oral fluid final rule and what you need to know as an employer to really get that up and rolling. With time, when the first labs are approved and the devices are announced, we will also do collector training and we'll do those live for a little while and then they will go to online training. But in the short term, it's so important. People have so many questions that it's so important to have live in-person training for this. So you can watch the, the Endesa website and see when we're coming to an area near you. And shortly after the DISA conference, we'll be in Dallas-Fort Worth. And we have Memphis and we have New York and we have other places coming up. But we've been everywhere so far from Seattle and Anchorage through Orlando. So again, just keep an eye out and remember we're bringing oral fluid training home to you. So now let's talk about the changes that are directly impacting the employers. You and not the employee will choose the collection methodology. So as I said, the vanilla chocolate cone scenario, what we're really talking about here is you're the employer, you're paying for this. It needs to be something that's consistent with you. By all means, if DISA is advising you, hey, we think this is the best type for random testing, this is the type for follow-up testing, certainly consult with your folks from DISA. Certainly share input, share thoughts, but ultimately you, the employer, will determine. So for example, you may say, I want all randoms to start with urine. If something becomes a shy bladder, I want those to go on to an oral fluid. I don't want a directly observed urine collection. I want a directly observed oral fluid collection as all oral fluid are. Uh, Follow-up tests, why would you really want to send somebody in for a directly observed urine collection when they're going to be a lot more expensive? You have to have a same gender observer. It's body to bottle observation. Oral fluid may be the best option for all of those tests for follow-up and return to duty because it's a lot less expensive when you view it in that direction. It's a best business practice to have a standing order in place with your instructions for your collection sites. Again, think of the vanilla chocolate. You want to be able to tell your collectors, this is what I want and this is when I want it to take place. You can do this without a standing order, theoretically, but then you're going to need to expect a call from a collector before every single test so that they can decide with you what it is that you want. And in order to avoid that, we recommend the standing order. So direct observation urine collections must not be performed for transgender and non-binary individuals. Once oral fluid testing is available, it must be used. So some of you are familiar with the scenario. Others of you have probably never thought about it. But what happens when you have a urine collection that requires a direct observation and the employee says, well, I don't want a male observer because I identify as female. What kind of observer do you choose? What gender? Right now, you go with what the employee says they identify as. It's not the collector's job to challenge it. It's not the employer's job to challenge it. However, oral fluid testing provides an alternative that makes it very easy to just say, it doesn't matter what gender the collector is. It's just an oral fluid test and it's directly observed. So DOT has mandated in any situation after the first labs are approved, in any situation where an employee says, I am transgender or non-binary, they're going to be granted an oral fluid test by that employer. So that's the only place that oral fluid is mandated, but it is an important civil rights issue. And both for the employee and for the observer, 
remember when you're asking somebody who to observe a collection and they may or may not be anatomically the same as the employee who they'll be observing excreting, that becomes a civil rights issue also for that observer. They have to be given the opportunity to say yes or no, I do or don't want to do this. So again, remember, there are a lot of complicated and civil rights related issues that urine tests can pose in transgender non-binary situations and that problem solved. The desired outcome is achieved because every oral fluid collection is a direct observation collection. You know, some employers have said, gee, that seems so unfair because if you're going to take an employee who's doing a urine test, they turn in a cold specimen and then that cold specimen is going to require a body to bottle observed collection. They only get oral fluid if they're non-binary or transgender. Well, first of all, that's up to the employer. You can say for every single person who has to go to a direct observed collection, I just want oral fluid. That's in your control. But if you don't want to do that, and for whatever reason, you don't want to try oral fluid testing, the bottom line is you're still getting a DOT regulated test result. So there's no unfairness to it. It's merely a question of there's a different type of test being administered under those circumstances for a very good reason. So it's all about the employer's choice in the shy bladder scenario or in a, or in a direct observed collection. But I want you to think about why would you choose to continue with your indirect observed collections? They are allowed but because you can do them doesn't mean necessarily that you should. And please don't leave this session thinking that we've eliminated direct observed urine collections. We have not. They are still very much present. But the question is, since it's required for non-binary non -binary and transgender individuals, why not just grant that to any of your employees who run into a direct observed collection situation? So now it's the employer's duty. We're going to talk a little bit about refusals generally. And I'm, I, let me give you a little background on this too. With the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration's clearinghouse, we have literally hundreds of thousands of employees who have been entered with non-negative test results. A non-negative can be a positive or it could be a refusal. And if that refusal happens at the collection site, it appears that a lot of employers are confused about who makes the determination at the collection site and how are those handled. Since part 40 was written, rewritten actually in the year 2000, it has been the employer's duty to determine whether a refusal has occurred at the collection site. The employers cannot delegate that duty per section 40.355i. It's a non-delegable duty. So the way it's supposed to work is a collector can tell you something appears to be a refusal and they can even say this is a refusal, but it's not a refusal until you as the employer make a determination. You wanna gather information from the employee. You wanna gather information from the collector. You wanna make a full and fair decision. And that is what goes into a refusal determination. But unfortunately, with the clearinghouse, we're seeing a lot of employers say, hey, you know, this is what my collector told me, and I have to do this. This is what my CTPA told me, and I had to declare it a refusal. But it's not necessarily. And that's something where you need to take the responsibility or you'll be contacted by the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration asking you if you took everything into consideration. Okay, service agents can provide advice and information to employers regarding refusal to test issues. And in that regard, I'm sure many of you would contact DISA and say, hey, listen, you know, the employee is saying this, but the collector said that. Can you help me sort my thoughts? Can you help me reach a decision? And that's fine. You can talk to your collectors, to your CTPA, to DISA and say, hey, you guys are the experts in this field. Would you help me through this? And that's perfectly fine. But don't blame DISA for the decision you made. Don't blame your CTPA or your collector because 
it doesn't replace your judgment as the employer. The employer's the one who determines whether a refusal under the DOT's regulation has occurred. And as a practice tip, be familiar with the DOT's employer handbook, what employers need to know about DOT drug and alcohol testing. And that's again on the ODAPSI webpage. When you go in under the employer tab, you'll see on the left, when you go into the ODAPSI page, www.transportation.gov forward slash ODAPSI, on the left side, there are key resources. When you click on that, pull up the employer section and you'll see right away the DOT employer handbook. On pages 25 to 28, they talk about the different kinds of refusals that may occur and who determines them. So if it's a laboratory-based refusal, meaning somebody put an adulterant actually into their urine specimen, that's going to be determined by the MRO because they're obtaining scientific information from the laboratory that leads them to the ultimate conclusion that this is a declared adulteration and therefore a refusal. You as the employer don't have a role in that one. And so pages 25 through 28 of this handbook are really going to help you figure that out. When is it your responsibility? And most of the time, it's going to be anything associated with the collection site is something that you need to make the determination about. Now, have you started thinking about your standing orders? Have you started thinking about your employer protocols and otherwise instructions for your collectors? You'll need to instruct your collection sites directly or through the CTPA, through DISA, through whomever, as to what type of testing you want in one situation. Again, your vanilla chocolate cone. And even if you only want one methodology used, you have to be clear about it. And you also have to remember that if you come into the transgender non-binary individual who needs to have that direct observed urine collection, that will not be done. It will be converted to a directly observed oral fluid collection. That is federal regulation. So there is a link here for Indesa's model standing order format, but I also spelled out the link so that you have that. And it's a long link. So I'm not going to read the whole link to you, but again, the Andesa's model standing order format, remember, is something that I developed uh, as the primary author of this final rule. And after all the consultations that I had had with Odapsi, and I did show them the model standing order before Andesa went final with it, and Joe McGuire turned it into a fillable PDF, I think you would really enjoy it. Um, as a matter of fact, I'm just going to give it a shot and see if it will open for us here. So this is the National Drug and Alcohol Screening Association model standing order for drug testing for DOT regulated employers. And it's a very simple format, lists the different types of DOT drug tests. The these are the reasons for testing. And you would just simply click what you do or don't want to have. So for random testing, you might choose to continue with urine, but for return to duty, you may choose to do oral fluid and follow up. You may want to do oral fluid because again, those are ones where you would have to have a direct observer. So we also have the problem collections listed and it talks about whether or not you want to continue or which, which type of method do you want to use when you have a shy bladder? You know, remember, shy bladders where you're going to have an employee sitting there for three hours. So most employers in the public comments said, oh, I am welcoming this because I want to get out of shy bladder scenarios where I've got my employee tied up at a collection site for three hours. And I, the collection site said, yes, we would like to not be tied up for three hours also. Um, so those are great scenarios for oral fluid testing. Here, you'll notice where I have directly observed collection arising under 49 CFR section 40.67, which is um, the direct observed section for any reason. And the, in, the donor identifies as a transgender or non-binary individual. There is no block to check because oral fluid is required by law. Now, the other blank, blanks are very important too. The designated employer representative is going to be listed here. The name of the authorizing official who can be the DER, the signature, the phone number, and the email. And that the company reserves the right to revise the standing order. 
Should they revise it and a collection site ends up with two copies, the collection site must use the later in time. So that is what the standing order looks like. Again, free of charge, available to you on the Endesa website at the email address in the screen. So again, here is your email address, or rather your website address for finding that standing order. And in the next slide, it's a static picture of the standing order that I just showed you in its entirety. And finally, we have time for a few questions. My email address on this detail to Endesa is patrice.kelly at endesa.com. And I will be on this detail through the year 2024, and I'm returning to DOT on April 1st, 2025. Awesome, Patrice. That was great information. Thank you so much for your time today. A couple quick questions from the audience. Um, first, uh, why is DOT regulated testing changing and is urine still okay to use? And that's a really good question. The reason why we're changing is to give employers options. For many years, employers have been very vocal about the fact that post-accident testing is extremely inconvenient from a urine standpoint because you have to find an enclosure and sometimes accidents take place far from any other facilities. So post-accident testing causes problems. And then other employers have been using in their non-DOT programs oral fluid and have great faith in it. And um, one of the things I want to mention, though, is this is not roadside testing. This is not on the spot testing. As I mentioned earlier, it's still HHS laboratory testing. And is it as effective? Yes. We covered the slides on the language exactly that HHS and DOT provided that will help employers to inform their employees that, yes, it is as accurate and fair and forensically defensible as urine has been over the last 30 years. Gotcha. And you had said two labs need to be certified by the HHS still. Will they be using the same device? It is highly likely that um, several labs will use the same device to start off. But as far as the primary and secondary lab, yes, they will. So in other words, when an employer sends somebody for an oral fluid collection, the laboratory, the collection site needs to know that the employer wants to do that, needs to know who the laboratory account is so that they are pulling the form for the correct laboratory. And then the one device will be used that gets subdivided in the presence of the donor. And both the primary and the secondary lab will work with that one device. So once this goes live, does every company need oral fluid standing orders just in case they have a direct observed? with a transgender or non-binary employee, or will collection sites just handle it correctly if I don't have a standing order in place? The collection sites and the employers are required in those situations to move to an oral fluid collection if the person's transgender or non-binary. So if you don't have a standing order, that will still happen. But I actually think Tom's Thomas, it's a good point to raise because as I've been going around the country talking to people and training, people have said, what happens if I conduct a urine test and the employer didn't want a urine test done? And the answer is the employer may not pay for it. They gotcha. may choose not to pay for it because you've done something that was outside what they authorized you to do. Mm -hmm. Now, the employee will still be responsible for the test result. So if you did a urine test when this employer only wanted oral fluid or you did an oral fluid when the employer only wanted urine and the employee is positive, that result will stand. But then the employer may say, no, I'm sorry, I didn't authorize that type of testing at all and I'm not paying you for it. And frankly, you didn't even use my lab or my MRO. So I've told collection folks that they're taking an awfully big risk if they implement a form of testing on their own without the employer's direction. No, that makes a lot of sense. Um, you said no labs have applied to get certified. What's preventing from that happening? And that's an excellent question um, that we can go into in a little more detail. Essentially, the devices have to be FDA approved, but not only devices, but the reagents, which is the chemistry that's used at the laboratory to 
actually test the drugs that are being gathered through or potentially being gathered through the uh, testing device. So there's FDA approval that has to occur that does not take place to the same degree on the urine side of the house. So the laboratories are, well, the manufacturers of the oral fluid devices are working their way through that FDA process. And then as soon as they're done, the laboratories are ready to jump forward and do this. So the laboratories are very eager to see this happen. It's more the FDA process that's slowing it right this minute. Gotcha. So if you had to put on your, 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 you know, hat and crystal ball, when would you expect labs and devices to be certified so that employers can use oral fluid? What the laboratories tell me is it's fair to say this summer, the summer of 2024. Okay. So it could be as early as May. It could be as late as July, but it's coming. And that's why in one of the slides, I said, you've got about four to six months to get ready for this, because we think that that's probably about what it's going to be. And we're all keeping our fingers crossed that it will be ready then. But once it's ready, uh, I think that there's going to be a huge movement toward at least considering this for employers. You know, we had 417 commenters to this rule, which is the most we've had since the major rule change back in the year 2000. And so many of those commenters were employers who said, please bring this on. We've waited long enough. So we think there's going to be a lot of excitement and um, collections will start right after the labs are approved. Awesome. Well, Patrice, I know we've run a, a little bit over the, the time. Of, thank you to you for, for coming on today. My pleasure. And again, thank you so much, Tadisa. Thank you for everybody who took time from their busy days to watch this. I really Absolutely. appreciate that. Okay. Absolutely. And looking thank forward you so to much seeing to everyone folks for attending. in the future in person. Yes, look forward to uh, more in-person activities for sure. Uh, thank you to everyone who attended today and uh, we'll hopefully uh, see you in another session.